Seven. I'm an evolving womanist, theologian, and interfaith chaplain, a wannabe quasi iconographer, <laughs> and that's someone that wants to do spiritual paintings and art. And so I'm looking to try to get a little more into doing that. I already do some drawing, but I do some sketching. I put some of my sketches on Facebook. Keep me in your prayers. <laughs> I want to thank you for allowing me to be here on this first day, this first Sunday of Lent, and the first Sunday of Lent, the Women's Month, which is wonderful to me because we get an opportunity to celebrate a wonderful time as a group. And we should appreciate each and every moment we get this time to share because there's no guarantee we'll be here tomorrow. So we will appreciate and we'll thank God for allowing us to share this real precious moment today. Amen. I want to thank Father Chris. I want to thank the ministerial clergy and staff. I want to thank the choir, the musicians. I want to thank the church family and my biological family and my sisters. I just am grateful to all of you and I thank you for supporting me and giving me an opportunity to be here and sit with you today. Thank you. Thank you. During this time, we have um, a Lenten meditation book. And it is um, out in the front. If you get an opportunity, pick one up. I mean, I've begun to go over it. It's a daily reading. This particular time, the uh, Episcopal Release, Relief and Development uh, campaign focused its concentration on children. Uh, they said that it's 400 children that they can count for that are not attended for and have to go into foster care regularly. And they dedicated this time because they wanted to make sure that you appreciated and we appreciate children. 
And so I had my little grand niece, <laughs> and I wanted to come up here, Amen. a little lady, yeah. to come up here and sing a little for us so that we can celebrate a little bit in God's name, our children. Come on, baby girl. and treat our planet as such because they'll be here when we're not. In short of dating myself, <laughs> I remember my mother, and, and I spoke to you guys about my mother a little bit. My mother is something. Uh, Edna Mary Forlan, and my Aunt Rose, Rose Marie used to call her that. You know, the Southern term, they call her May, Edna May. And um, may they both rest in, in peace in God's house. They both have passed. And my dear brother, who passed last year of brain cancer, complications of brain cancer, he was with us too in that past. And that's my brother Sidell was a, the second. And my current brother that's living, Benson Jr., he was with us too in that past. And we would all be sitting on family night, sitting there, watching TV. My little sister, she actually was actually too small to really remember this, but she might have remembered a little later. And we would be watching my mother's favorite comedy television show. And that was called Flip Wilson, the Flip Wilson Show. <laughs> the Flip Wilson Show was an hour long variety show that originally aired in the United States on NBC from September 17, 1970 to June 27, 1974. Uh, the show starred African-American comedian Flip Wilson. The program was one of the first American television programs starring a black person in the title role to becoming highly successful with a white audience. Specifically, it was the first successful network variety series starring the African-American in, in general. And during the first two seasons, the television ratings for this show um, reached uh, 
the nation's second highest for the most watched show. Wilson was most famous for creating the role of Geraldine Jones. <laughs> Geraldine Jones was a, a, a fictional African-American character, although we probably know women that are like her. <laughs> and the most uh, uh, famous reoccurring uh, persona or character that Flip Wilson uh, portrayed. She was a sassy, liberated Southern woman with a coarsely flirty yet faithful to her unseen boyfriend killer. <laughs> Poorly educated, she was nevertheless confident and she did not change her behavior to suit anyone. Several of Geraldine's sayings entered the U.S. popular culture as catchphrases, and you probably remember some of these. Especially something like, uh, when you're hot, you're hot, and when you're not, you're not. <laughs> that was one of hers. And another one uh, was, what you see is what you get. And particularly one that we might see that fits into the title of my sermon today, and that is, the devil made me do it. <laughs> Therefore, join me for my sermon title, the devil made me do it, the devil made you do it, or really, was it just my choice or was it just your choice? Amen. In view of the scripture re uh, readings on Genesis, if we just got that read to us, it was wonderful. Bad choices have always been with us from the days of Adam and Eve. You know the story, you know, everybody knows this story. When both, and I repeat both, made the choice to be tempted by the serpent, who had been called, in many cases, people call this serpent, and, and, and I've heard in, in Christian circles, the devil, Satan. And this serpent encouraged the, uh, Eve to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and Adam was present. He was there, too, and he decided that he also would eat of the fruit as well. They was tempted because they received a promise from the tempter from, from, from an animal, from, from a snake. <laughs> Can you imagine the snake, an animal telling you, uh, go ahead and, and eat that. Uh, they were um, also made this promise and they took on to it because they really, um, really wanted to be God. You know, they really, they, they had to. Because really one of the things that the serpent asked them, he said, um, he told Eve, he says, you know, you're not gonna be in any trouble if you go ahead and eat this apple. You know, it's good to look at. You know you want a piece. Go ahead and take a bite. And Eve went on and took a bite because, you know, who, who wouldn't want to be immortal? Who wouldn't want to live for, forever? You know? Who wouldn't want to call their own shots? Who wouldn't want to pay a cost but still be the boss. Thank you, James Brown. Well, the serpent got them all put out of hand. He got them all, they had to all pack up and, and go because of their bad choices. And God punished everybody. He punished the man, he punished the woman, he punished the serpent. I mean, because at one point, they never said anything about the serpent, but then all of a sudden he was, you know, whirling around. Because I'm assuming that at one point he wasn't whirling around. So he was whirling around, and he wasn't in, in heaven. And God actually said, look, um, you guys are going, you know, out of here <laughs> to your new place called Earth. You know, you know you're going to be, you know, short of hell up out of here. Because underneath this Earth, metaphorically, they see it and know it to be hell. And earth itself provides a type of hell. I don't know if you've experienced some of it. <laughs> earth, hell. Yeah. So can you imagine that beautiful place that they was once in and now they're in a place where they have to make their own way, so to speak. Be in some pain here from a woman's perspective and a man's perspective as he tills the soil. Paul better explains this in Romans 5 and 18 as one man, humans, trespass 
led to the condemnation for all. This was said to be the, the starting point of humanity's failure, the beginning of sinful human nature. And thinking about this um, temptation thing, you know, I, I think about some people, and I have had some people that I've known and been, uh, been friends with that are addicted to gambling. And this kind of reminds me of when they would use their whole rent money, you know, for the month. Um, to go to the boat. You, you guys know what the boat is, right? Just want to make sure everybody knew what the boat was. Um, and um, with a promise made by the tempter, the animal, the same one that convinced Adam and Eve, the devil made me do it, serpent, uh, tells them, go ahead and use your last few dollars. Thank you, Johnny Taylor. Um, at the blackjack table. You go win this time. Then they play and lose and lost all their rent money. Or people who have food addictions, right? You know, they're, I know I'm, I'm one, I'm, I'm a sweet tea person. I like uh, candy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, there was a restaurant on the north side when I lived there years ago, and uh, they served kind of delicious tasting buttercream donuts. That the you know and, and and in many cases some people would you know would be in there and I would I met this woman and she actually was diabetic <laughs> she had diabetes mellitus two <laughs> type two and she would make the statement that she would walk by that donut shop every morning before she went to work on purpose <laughs> and she knew that she could have took a different route but she did. She knew her sugar levels were gonna be high. But here comes the tempter, the snake, talking to her. The same one that convinced Adam and Eve. The devil made me do it, serpent. Telling her, go ahead, eat that donut. You know you won't. It won't hurt. You gonna win this time. Then when she ate it, she lost. And she had to end up in the hospital. Y'all, you know for so long I have heard sermons from the preachers that have said some really mean things about Adam and Eve. Especially Eve. They, they would say things like Eve was responsible for the breakdown of the calamity of this world. Have you ever asked yourself if you could have done better? Could you have done better as a human being? Could you have been in their place and did any better? I, I couldn't stop eating buttercream donuts. <laughs> but yeah, there was a person, one human, one man, one very man, one very God, that uh, did make this, that made this decision, that did not boil into the games of the devil that actually came up against the serpent. And that was our name, the name we're so familiar with, Jesus Christ. The serpent made a choice, a bad choice, to roll up on Jesus. He tells Jesus in Mark 4, chapters 3 and 4, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And Jesus said, it is written, one does not live by buttercream donuts alone. I, I mean, um, by bread alone. <laughs> but by every word that comes from the mouth of the, of, of the Lord our God. The tempter, the serpent, the, the snake, the devil made another bad choice. He wanted to put Jesus on blast. By taking Jesus to the high city and placing him on the pinnacle of the temple. And saying in Matthew's verse, uh, chapter 4, verses 5 to 6, he told them, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you and will pay the lottery, play the lottery for you, and you'll win $4 million. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, <laughs> on their hands, they will bear 
you up so that you will not dash your feet against the stone. And Jesus said to him again, it is written, do not put the Lord God to the test. Matthews 4, 8, and 11 again, because here come the tempter again. You're going to keep coming back until you resist him, and then he will flee. Again, the tempter, the serpent, the snake, the devil made another bad choice in believing he could trump, and I do mean all puns against that. <laughs> he, he could trump his tricks that he played on Jesus before. So he took Jesus to a very high mountain and showing him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to Jesus, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And I believe this was much like he has told many corrupt leader of that day and this day. And across this globe, not just the United States, but across the globe. Making them believe that they could be gods too. That they could be immortal, that they could call all the shots, that they could do this without paying the cost to be the boss. The same promises that was made to Adam and Eve. But Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And like the coward Satan is, like the coward, the tempter, the snake, the animal, the devil, he left. And suddenly, angels came to wait on Jesus. Isn't God miraculous when he sends us angels to come and watch over us? I remember those angels in my day of temptation watching over me. Jesus did it. He did it for you. He did it for me. He is often referred to as the second Adam. So the first Adam didn't get this quite right. Him and Eve. So Jesus came to get it right. You've heard of him to be the prince of peace. The devil has no authority in a believer's life. He can't call any shots. The decision is yours. The choice is yours. Jesus is living within the believer. The hope of glory. The best preacher, the teacher, the way maker, light burden giver that I've ever known. Ain't nobody like Jesus. My Lord, my sweet Jesus Christ. From the day he was born, his life was put on the front line parents had to take him and get him out of where he was and bring him over to Egypt. He was born to the virgin Mother Mary. He was given a choice to walk this world on a peculiar ministry, and that was to save my life, to save your life, as a sacrifice for a ransom for many. And he accepted the responsibility and fulfilled all the law that we as humans, as Adams and Eves, could never fulfill. As Paul explained it better in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 and 19, sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those who sinned were not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type that one was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died through the one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abound for many. Because the one man's trespass, death, exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercised dominion in life through that one man, Jesus Christ. So it is important for us to understand, hey, you whosoever, whosoever up in here, I'm speaking to you, a divine daughter of God. I just stopped by to ask you a question. Do you know that Jesus is not mad at you? Do you know that? He's mad about you. He 
He, he is here and he's knocking at your door, the door of your heart, asking you to open it up so he can come in. I mean, he brought some dinner with him. Amen. Hope, love, peace, and righteousness. Amen. He wants to sit down with you and have dinner with you. Will you let him in to your heart? Would you allow him to sit with you? He's asked me to let you know this. He said, rest in his love. Rest in his peace. Rest in his hope. He said, come to him, all you who are weary and burdened, and he will give you rest. Take his yoke upon you and learn from him, for he is gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest in your soul, for his yoke is easy and his burden is light. God bless you. Thank you for having me. Amen. 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 We can do a little better than that, St. Mark. This is one of our own. Amen. That's what they used to say when I was a kid. You can do better than that. <laughs> I want to um, just uh, capitalize on what something she talked about that God loves us, right? That God loves us. Uh, and I think and we love God. Can we sing a little bit of Oh How I Love Jesus? Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Every time I think about you and 
Every time I read about you, every time I hear your name, I start to smile. And every time the sun, every time the sun starts shining, and every time the wind starts blowing, every time I feel your anointing, I start to smile. Let me take the time to say I love you. Let me take the time to say I care. We accept God's invitation to be ever mindful of the needs of others. 
offering our prayers on behalf of that community and the church and the world. Please stand as you're able for our prayer to the Lord. Good morning, St. Martin. Good morning. Good morning. Our great God has formed the dust of our being in the midst of waters of creation. Let us adore the righteous one, saying, O oh God, feed us with your mercy. Lord, hear our prayer. For the tree of Golgotha, our true tree of life, by whose just fruit we live, the church worships you, O oh God. May your people ever praise and serve you in all the world's people. O oh God, of O oh God, feed us with your mercy, Lord. Hear our prayers. O oh God of the seas and rains, we praise you for watering and sustaining all things living. We bless you for the waters flowing from Jesus' pierced side. Give to all candidates of baptism and to all the baptized the sure hope of your grace. O oh God, feed us with your mercy. Lord, hear our prayers. Send us to the nations where there is famine of the word. Show us those who await the bread of life and confront us with those who suffer in hunger. May our abundance supply their need. O oh God, feed us with your mercy. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord and judge of all, confirm what is good and just in the hearts of those who rule the nations. Make all in authority to govern in, in justice the peoples whom you have made. O oh God, feed us with mercy, Lord. Hear our prayers. For all who desire wisdom, for all who need hands to bear them up, for the naked and the outcast, for the sick and the dying, for all in the need of your gift of abundance, help, we pray for your mercy, Lord. Hear our prayers. And we pray for those listed in our program, for Reverend Karen Bavaro, Luis Rodriguez, Ms. Winters, Kieran Smith, Father Christopher Griffin, Oscar Douglas Brown, Avril and family, Albert Hogan, Tanisha Ward, Kamora Ingram, Lucy Henry, Nancy Wilson, Darlene Walls, Layla Wells and Kashif Walls. And are there any other intercessions? 